Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 406 for Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here, as is occasional in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> how, how is the occasional visit to your home in Napomo there, Paul? It's been a very relaxing little stretch here. We're, we're really, you know, in two homes these days. Uh, not quite 50-50, but it's funny, the, the some of the things that were made me restless down in this new area. Cause you know, I've told you I've lived in New York and, and Silicon Valley. Right. And when we, when we moved down here, I, th- I thought I would adapt to the quiet a lot easier and it's harder for me. My wife, uh, you know, bless her has been, has been, she loves it. I mean, it's, and the house, you know, we're ha- so happy in the house. Sure. It's very serene, but like, but like, what do you want to do tonight? Oh, let's go to the music. Let's go get something to eat. And like, Oh, yeah, that's going to take a while. So. <laughs> but a little bit of schlep. Huh. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. And 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 as people might hear occasional blips, sometimes the internet way far out in the burbs uh, is a little blippy too. So um, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it hasn't been an issue for a long time. It's it, it wants to mess with us, Paul. That's how it works. That's how it works. That's how it works. Um. Christmas is canceled, Paul. I got to tell you. That's it. Christmas is canceled. You're calling it off? Well, it's not me. I'm just informing you of something I've been told. And uh, it's not so much I've been told as that I've intuited it from the fact that uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that you, you, maybe this is your fault. You said, you know, I'm not hearing of anybody having any Christmas gigs. I don't know if people aren't doing that this year or what. And I, you know, butted in and said, I have two. I went and rehearsed with uh, our friend Dave Brunyak, who was on the show. He he, uh, his alter ego is Dallas Corbin. He does this country thing now, which is great for him. Like hearing him sing these country tunes, it's perfect for his voice. It's great. And obviously, you know, he's a phenomenal guitar player. The musicians that he has in his band are great, and they needed a sub for two of their uh, Christmas gigs. Bass player and I got along well. Everybody could play. Like super great people, great musicians. And one by one, the uh, the two gigs that we had scheduled dropped off. The clubs, oh. yep, both of them. Two Saturday nights in a row. Yep. They were like, yeah, we haven't sold enough tickets. We're a little gun shy about just waiting on walk-ups. So, yeah, it's a no. Christmas is canceled, Paul. Mm. No Christmas. You. It turns out you were right. No well, problem. and it's still, I don't, I don't know of very many corporate Christmas parties. I don't know very many New Year's Eve things. A couple of restaurants that are trying to, you know, make sure that they get their crowds in for that stuff. But like, if it can fund things, it's just been a lot less work this time. I, yeah. It, it, it turns out that is true. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the, uh, what the deal is, but yeah, that's, that, that's how it is. I have a friend who is a football coach. Hang with me and I'll get to this analogy. In a okay. Second. Yep. And, and he um, is keenly aware about how things have changed for high school football or, or youth football as, as concussions have become more of a concern or more awareness about concussions. For sure. And I asked him, do you think there'll be youth level footballers? He said, yeah, I do, but it's going to keep changing. I mean, even now the kids can't wear pads to like, the last two weeks and they don't learn tackling into such an early age, at least out in California. And, you know, he's just, you know, like this is where things are going. Is it time to have the conversation? All things that we know, budgets are, you know, everything, you know, it, the, the music that has been out there and been played is largely, you know, in the cover realm, much older people's music or music that much older people have grown up with. Will there be cover bands in 10 years? Huh. That I I think well so there's there's two ways it could go. 
it, it could it could totally peter out, right? Like and and kind of go with the well, DJs are simpler. We just play the music that we know. We want to hear the songs, the versions that we know. It's fine. Like just go with that. Um, or it goes completely the other way, and the, people want to see. People can't go see. Well, you can go see the Rolling Stones. I think that'll be true until the day. Well, the day we die, Paul, because then we're not able to go see the Rolling Stones anymore. But they'll keep playing. Right. You know, that's nice. But in general, like a, a lot, you know, the bands that are playing the songs that most cover bands play are old. Like they're, they're, there's not a ton of new music being played by cover bands out there, at, at least from what we from what I see. It, it, of the bands that I see, but also people talking on like social media and stuff. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing that like the newer music has, it, there, there's certainly some, but by and large cover bands still have a significant chunk of their repertoire, if not their entire repertoire of these, you know, songs from the sixties, seventies and eighties. And I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, and so Will 10 years from now, will that even if the demand only remains for songs from the 60s, 70s and 80s, which I, I really don't think that's going to happen. I, I think that people are going to want to hear songs from the 90s. People are going to want to hear the Matchbox 20 and the Bare Naked Ladies and Foo Fighters and like that kind of stuff that that people grew up with. They want to hear. Right. And uh, but. Are tribute bands going to be more in demand than just your generic cover band? Like, is it, is it going to take something that with a little more effort and thought and all of that, that that gets there? It's all over the place in this. I, obviously like the fairs and festivals, at least out here, they're as popular as ever, right? They're, you know, people enjoy a nice evening in their community. That's done by eight o'clock in the summertime, listening to live music. That, that seems to be a solid thing. Or do you know the clubs have kind of changed? We're definitely seeing musicians playing to tracks or acoustic, you know, kind of more, you know, toned down music has a little bit of a place. Yep. But but less clubs out here. I don't know where you are, but certainly less clubs to go out for a, a night, you know, to go dancing to live music. There's less of that out here. So, you know, the plus, the, the fairs and festivals are as popular as ever. It is something you gotta you gotta weigh into it. Like most of the people who listen to us, I wonder how what the average age of a listener is. I wonder, you know, when I watch the conversations, you're right, 60s, 70s, and 80s seems to be the the high watermark of what most bands are digging into. Yeah, I mean they're certainly why, playing why songs the 90s from the nineties, but but it's not the bulk of the material yet. Well, why why do you think that's gonna get it even more? Because that, that music's been out there to play for a long time. The, the people who grew up on that music who have or have not picked up an instrument could have played it. But so, you know, we're, we're 30 years past the nineties now. Right. So wh why, what's it waiting for? <laughs> that's, a, that's a fair question. I, I, we like when monkey fist plays, we find it was interesting. We played that, that smoky place a couple of weeks ago, the, the, uh, the club victoire or whatever it was. And the we played stuff you know all the way through we played sweet home alabama and we played you know uh, stone temple pilots and and everything in between and even some stuff newer than that and the 90s stuff were the songs that we got the biggest reaction out of mm. um yeah yeah like the you know the, the stone temple pilots the bare naked ladies the matchbox 20 I, I, we have been toying with this idea of like a combined tribute band. You know, we, I talked about my friend Dave played for a while in that band when we interviewed him uh, in that band, Pink Talking Fish, which combines uh, Pink Floyd, Talking Heads and the band Fish, right? And and plays the songs. We were coming, we were in Monkey Fist, we were talking about, well, should we like put together a full band that is um, – like Matchbox 20 and Bare Naked Ladies songs. And I was like, yeah, but you need one more band to fill that out. And then, of course, I had the the idea of calling it the Bare Naked Matchbox Cars, right? And so you, you play some Cars <laughs> tunes. And um, I think that would go over well. I, but yeah, it was, it was the first time that I've seen that happen with a Monkey Fist gig where, I, and we always 
have we have a healthy dose of 90s stuff because John his voice is perfect for that night. His voice is perfect for pretty much everything, but he really like he knows that that 90s stuff and it just crushes it. But um it was the first time that I I noticed the crowd reacting more to that than you know the the sort of meat and potatoes of the stones and the the you know Skinner and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it so was add ten years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it pick a number, whatever the average cover band playing sixty seventies, the you know pick a number. How old do you think they are? And in ten years. You know, I mean, I know there's, there's still guys in their 70s yeah. playing in cover bands around here. Yeah. I mean, I mean playing a lot. So I don't know. It, it is it, interesting. Like, when will when will the 60s and 70s let's, let's forget about the 80s for right now? When will the music of the 60s and 70s go out of vogue to play in your general business cover band? Like, will that happen within the next 10 years? Or will that never happen? Like, I, 50s would definitely be novelty now. You play Johnny B. Good or, you know, some, some, from, you know, 50s rock. That's fair. And that would be almost weird now, right? Yep. But 50s isn't part of that genre that was defined and, and etched into no, stone as classic You're, rock, right? For, yeah. For, I'm agreeing. But if you're saying it's still 60s, 70s, and 80s, at one point, it was 50s, 60s, and 70s, or, you know, 50, right? At Fair. one point, pl- playing playing those Chuck Berry songs w- would have been a part of a GB. So, you know, the question is, when will 60s stuff fall to that? Yep. Classic music, you know, timeless music. Yeah, will we lose? Because they, if you lose the 60s, the entirety of the Beatles catalog is off the table, right? And, and I'm not saying there needs to be some hard line drawn in the sand, but at what point do people, do, do, do Beatles songs just fall off? And and maybe that's already happening. I I don't know. We we added a Beatles song to the Monkey Fist set list. We played back in the USSR the other night for the first time with that band. So I think it's probably X amount of time after the last Beatle passes away. Because right now, yeah, you know, Paul and Ringo to some degree, you know, they they do a tour. There's a whole bunch of nostalgia around them. People take their kids, all that type of stuff. I think once once they're not. They're, they're kind of out of they, they'll be they'll become, you know, Shakespeare, Mozart, that, you know, that classic old thing that is brought dusted off and brought out on occasion. But it, I don't know if it'll be essential. I don't know. I'm talking out of both sides. Of my, no, I, it, I well, this know. is this is but this is an interesting conversation to have, because I, I, obviously neither one of us like spent a lot of time prepping for this. You just sort of threw it out there, which which is want to happen with us here. We ha- we will have an agenda and then somebody one of us will have a wild wild hair and off it goes. Um, but it is interesting to sort of just dissect this and even jumping sides. You, you know what I mean? Like it, it, there's an interesting, I don't, cause we can't know no, we'll, the we'll, answer, obviously. Yeah. It's a good question. What, what will, what will cover bands be in 10 years? Can it sustain exactly what it is right now? Not much, not much sustains, you know, for that long music changes, venues change. Yeah. But there is demand. Like I said, the rise of these, local concert series and you know fairs is definitely a thing out here would you say it's the same where you are like 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 not, and also you know like go ahead no i was gonna say to answer your question not like it is out on the west coast no it, we okay. don't have that no the, the the i mean there are some you know concerts on the green and in, in town squares and stuff but they're, they're not it, when i came out and saw what you guys had and that was like normal it's like okay, this is times ten compared to what happens here on the East Coast. So yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. interesting to think. I mean, you do it until we can't do it anymore. But I mean, all the strategies against you know this is what's going to be the next thing. I thought the tribute band thing would have died out a long time ago. I'm surprised that it it had so much legs to it. I think it has more. Um, it, it and you might be right. Like that might be the next thing. Is that it? you you have to be an act with a with a theme in and in, in order to but but then again here's the other thing anything that you do i a lot of the people who go to those outdoor concert series are people you know retired people people little young families that just want a nice night out 
you know, low cost, just go relax in, in a park somewhere. Yeah. Why would that ever change? Right. Well, that should never change. Yeah, that doesn't happen here. So <laughs> it's like, is it I, because I, is it because it's is it because of bugs? Is it just because the humidity in the in the Northeast? You don't just sit outside for long periods of time at night. That I think that's part of it. I think our season to do it is also shorter than yours, and yeah. and there's enough rain in the summer here. Risky that, that it you well yes it's risky, but you also just know that a certain number of things are going to get rained out. This past summer was, uh, was f- a, a phenomenal amount of rain uh, compared to yeah. previous f- compared to normal, but even still, it's like, it would be, it would be completely rare for me to make it through a summer without a gig getting rained out. Now this summer, it was you know rare to make it through with a gig that actually happened, but you know, that's, that was this summer, but yeah, it, I think that's part of it. And I think you're right about the bugs. Yeah. It it can be rough um, yeah. in the evenings here. You know that that perfect twilight time where you'd want to be out watching a band play, where it's still a little bit sunlight or whatever. That that's the worst time to be outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw a post on one of the. I think it might have been uh, Cover Band Central, and someone said, "What is the deal with with tribute bands?" I'm amazed that this thing happens. And one of the one of the responses was, "Well." There's a pretty big continuum. They're the ones who are like all in, yeah. Sound like them, use the use the equipment like them, dress like them, and those are the people who just play the songs. That that's not really a tribute if you just play the songs, which you know that's up for debate. I suppose. Sure, sure. Yeah. But uh, you you wonder if that's what the continuum will be like. In order to be, if 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 there are a hundred bands in your area right now, there's probably. 60% of them are generic cover bands and 40% of them are tributes. Maybe, maybe, maybe a little 70, 30. Yeah. That, but the, right but the, the business, I, I think that does sound right. Um, but the, the tribute bands are the ones that are playing at a completely different level. Right. I mean, we interviewed, interviewed awesome. Bruce Hilton from that Tom Petty from being Petty. Right. Yeah, and yeah. you know, they were, I don't want to say they were just starting out when when he was on the show, which was earlier this year, I think. Maybe it was last year, but it was recently. But they were it was early in in their career. Like they were playing their first big gig, you know, two weeks after he was on the show. And now they've got agency representation. They're rocking out there. They're playing, you know, all the sort of top tier tribute band stages around the area of 500 to a thousand seat venue kind of thing. And that's, that's what they're doing. And I, I'm, I don't, I mean, I haven't seen their books, but I like, when you look at the number of people, they're obviously making more money than, than your traditional, you know, bar band. And yeah. they put the work in, they dress to a degree. They dress like the band. They play a lot of the same gear as, as you know, the heartbreakers did. And like, you know, they, they own a, enough of it to put on that show right and and there's uh, like there's other bands around here i i told you i saw that eagle mania band with constantine prior to that he was playing in foreigner's journey there's another eagles band called dark desert eagles and the lead singer of that um is pat badger he plays guitar in that band but he plays bass in extreme right you know but he does oh. this right yeah exactly and then there's um Lotus Land, the Rush band that I've mentioned around here. And then there's all the Beatlemania bands that, you know, tour around the country and play in their various pockets. And 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 that's just, we're just scratching the surface. There's Van Halen tributes that we've talked. I mean, there's tributes for lots of things. And it seems like it's growing. And I think as, especially as the people who are in the bands that are being paid tribute to, as those people pass away, the demand for that tribute band increases at least for a short period of time. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, if we got Beatlemania bands still playing, that's not a short period of time, man. <laughs> like the Beatles haven't yeah. played in a long time. So it's interesting. And, and then there's bands like Leonard Skinner and the Rolling Stones who are still out there touring with, I mean, with the Rolling Stones, at least there's foreigner and foreigner. Are there any original members in Foreigner? I don't think so, right? No, none. Right. So that's like, I know it's called Foreigner because legally they retained the rights to do that. And that's fine. Like, I'm I'm not begrudging yeah. them that. But, but like, 
what's the other than the legal rights to the name foreigner? What's the difference between that and a tribute band other than the size of the venues that they are able to fill? I, like, there's no difference. I, uh, I don't know. And, and then you think, remember that we had that great conversation about will, will the, the lawyers involved with these groups get around to saying, well, listen, we're going to license cover tribute bands, right? So if you're going to take our likeness and play our music, we're going to get a little bit of this too. And so, you know, you're going to see licensed cover bands. I, I wonder about tribute. that. Yeah, right. Licensed tribute make, bands. That, it, it makes sense that that would happen. I mean. Yeah, I, I guess. I don't know that. I don't know that there's any legal standing. For, I, it makes sense that people would want to make that happen. I, I don't think that, like, I think there might be, there's a, let's say that there's a world where there is a, a licensed um, rush tribute band, right? You, you know, I don't think that's going to stop Lotus Land or New World Men or any of the other rush tributes that happen from playing because the rights to those songs are such that once they've been released into the public, anyone can cover them as long as you're paying the ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC rights. I forget which group they're with. I think Rush was with BMI. Wait, wait, but, but what you said is important because the bands are not paying that fee. The venues are paying that fee. So if the lawyers get fair. involved with this and they're like, no, 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 let's go and you know, let's make bands responsible. They're the ones that are, that are, you know, taking the intellectual property and putting it out there again. They're the ones who should be, who should be paying. That would, that would, that would kill live music largely, but it would open the door to this. Yeah, but it wouldn't happen because lawyers are smart and this is why they go after the venues and not the bands because you can't get blood from a stone. Right. Deeper pockets. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So like I, I, somebody needs to pay the royalties right now. You're correct that it is the venues. They, they, but they don't get to ask app and, and BMI and CSAC don't get to change the deal uh, easily. I mean, the, the deal can always be changed. Right. But like, it's pretty well codified what the deal is. So if they yeah. were to come in and say, Oh, by the way, yeah, like they, like, Rush in in our example here doesn't get to the, the whoever controls the estate that we call you know Rush's music doesn't get to go to ASCAP or BMI and say hey by the way we need you to charge triple now like that deal is already inked they they don't get to rewrite that deal and so mm. I, like I I don't I don't see that happening but if you had the choice of going to see four different Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers tribute bands and being Petty is one that was like, uh, you know, certified by the Tom Petty estate yeah. that would add value to them and might get them the ability to play in larger venues. So I can see it working in the other direction as opposed to being punitive about it being, you know, it being additive to it. Like, oh, this is the one authorized tribute band. And, you know, I don't know what that criteria would be. I assume it'd be different for every every estate and of course then there's the whole thing of well who owns the rights to the songs a lot of times it's just an investment firm like springsteen sold off most of it right you know so so does the like if somebody you know put out a springsteen tribute band that was like authorized by the you know the people who own springsteen songs it's like well it's just some corporate entity like who does that really but mean the, the corporate entity would be more likely to want to squeeze the money out of it as opposed to the artists mm-hmm. who originally owned it? That would be like, you know, whatever. It's cool. My music is getting out there. Yeah, right? exactly. So I don't, I don't know. They, it, the, I think the, the point is more if you think about it as a financial problem, the change that will happen over the next 10 years is much different than if you think about it as an, a supply and demand or an art problem. Yep. Right. Yep. So if you're literally just thinking about, as these classic rock acts start dying off, how how are people going to maximize, you know, the long tail of their investments in their catalog? Yeah, so, yeah, that's true. Things will change. I think. It, I think absolutely things will change. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the fact that the songs are now owned by corporate entities, and that will that will ch- increase, right? The 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 number of estates that wind up selling these song catalogs out. I mean, yeah. right now we're talking about the artists themselves doing it, but certainly the families of the artists who have passed 
would potentially be far more likely in some cases to sell the catalog off to realize those gains and, and, you know, spend them on other things or whatever that might be. Um, so that like, once that happens and it's all corporate owned, you're right. The whole reason that they buy it is to squeeze. And so, uh, and there, there has to be a long-term plan that someone who buys a 73 year old guy's yeah. catalog is probably thinking about how am I going to be making my money back over 20 years, 30 years, 50 years and beyond. Well, but at some and point so those, be- those rights expire. Oh, I don't know anything about that. You can, yeah, you can renew them. Oh, crap. I w- now I wish I had done the research because I, I, I looked at this recently enough to know that there's a specific thing and not recently enough to remember what it is, but it, there is a certain number of years. I want to say it's 30 years when you initially, you know, register your song for copyright. Let's say it's 30. You can then renew it pretty easily for another 30 years or whatever that time period is. But after that, it's kind of over public domain. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but the point still say it's 30 years. So you bought this yeah. 73 year old guy's catalog. His fans are, you know, 50 to 60, you know, older. Yeah, right. yep. how are you going to make your money on them? You know, it, licensing it to movies. There's not, you know, streaming doesn't seem to pay back. No, very much so. They ain't gonna do but it. Someone knows the answer to that. Someone, someone knows what Springsteen's worth music will be worth in twenty years to somebody. Yeah, and what the Beatles' music is going to be worth in twenty years, and so I'm sure someone farther smarter than me, Dave, has already done that calculation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Somebody. You know, I, well, I would presume the people buying these song catalogs have done that calculation because otherwise, why would they invest the money? Yeah. Right? Like they want to make their money back in five years. Right. That that would be my guess. And right. then after that, it's profits, you know, and, and maybe less like businesses today are selling for multiples of like three X profits, you know, four X profits, like five X would be a, a, a gift for a lot of businesses. So I wonder what they're. Um, yeah. How, how are they? Maybe it's that once they buy the catalog, you're right. Like the commercials, all the things that the artist would would never have done. Those people don't care. It's like, whatever. It's, like, it's just an investment. Like, sure, take the songs. Let's go. Yep. yep. Hey, yep. Sp- speaking of changes um, over the next nine years, I want to I want to know what I want to be able to discuss what this is in, in, in what the state of cover bands is in 10 years. We've been doing this for nine years. But there's a change happening soon, Paul. You want to you want you want me to tell people you want to tell people. I think you should tell people. Okay, it's it's your news, so I didn't want to, you know, steal your thunder. Um, this is something Paul and I have been talking about for a long time. And by a long time, I mean several months. Uh, but it's a conversation that's been happening maybe maybe a year with your new uh, newfound employment arrangement. Scheduling for GigGab has been a challenge, to say the least, and and has been causing an undue amount of pressure on your schedule. And we don't want that. That's not what good friends do for each other. And so starting in January, Paul will be on the show less frequently than, uh, than it had, than has been. You will be back on, I hope a regular basis, but, um, but things are going to change a little bit. I've got a bunch of people that have many of whom have been on the show already that are going to come and share their gig stories and keep that part of this going with me. And then I've also got some really fun interviews and, and guests that are sort of like, you know, one-off folks. So there, there's quite a bit that I'm excited to do with this show. Uh, You know, you and I talked about, well, you know, if you want to stop doing it, what do we, what do we do next? And I really, I enjoy doing this show. I know you folks enjoy listening. And I, I, I know that the guests that we've had on, especially this year, have been some of your favorite episodes. And so we'll lean into that for a little bit and we'll do that together. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, David, I've been friends for a long time and, and doing this was a, was an expression of our friendship. I mean, us doing it together has been an expression. As you guys have heard many times, we used to call each other and just talk about our music lives and just like a regular bro thing that we would do. And it turned into a show because Dave knew how to do a show. And um, so we've done it for nine years. It's just been great. Heard from so many cool people. It's been 
weekly therapy in many ways, you know, oh, to yeah. just kind of talk about our lives. But, you know, and in the decision to not continue has been has been a bunch of emotions because, you know, I, I literally lived through mostly getting my band off the ground on this show, mostly that one point in time where I had, you know, such amount of freedom, I tried to make music a full-time gig for me and, and go through what it's like to try and like pay your bills through music. That was, you know, crazy. A band that got pretty successful, you know, I, I learned how to do solo work and had side projects and what effect that would have on my band life. I mean, it, it's been so many things that I've been able to share, talk about, get great feedback, you know, get, get called out on my stuff when, you know, I'm in the wrong and, you know, get encouraged when people agreed with me. It's been such a great experience, but yes, life changes. I'm not, I'm not, I, I am, I have never derived a hundred percent of my income and house payments and retirement and grandkids and, and things that I think about. I, I stumbled into a great day job that I really enjoy. And now I look at my time so possessively and it's funny to me because i can remember where all thoughts about my free time were how do i fill it with music 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 i mean literally you know sacrificing other things in order to find more time to do music and i know what that feels like so to sit here in the reality that that's that's at least right now that's not who i am anymore and that my time is just so scarce i'm not going to say it's any more precious than anybody else's but it's just it's there's just not a lot of time. And, you know, at the end of a long day, you're, you are a machine, Dave, like you, you work all day, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly admirable and, and, you know, my ultimate respect to you, but I definitely need, you know, to people, and I have less stuff to bring to the show by playing less. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe by coming on occasionally, I'll store up some good stories and some interesting things to share, but it's been so fun. I mean, and so many great experiences. We talked to so many cool people, heard some great stories, felt really part of a, a musician community uh, around the world. We've heard from people from around the world. And so th that's all great. But, you know, the reality is life changes, things change, priorities change, everything like that. You are going to just do great with it because you have such a passion for it. Every day you have a passion for it. You love being a musician. You love talking to musicians. You love talking to people who make music stuff. So I'm sure you're going to find a million more cool stories to share with listeners. Thank you. Yeah, I I agree. I you know at first it was like oh crap. Well, this is going to be different. It, you know, and and let's be perfectly clear, it's going to be different. Right? There's no way around that. And then as I started to kind of come to grips with the reality of it and, and start playing with ideas about, well, what if we take, cause I, there was certainly there was the, well, we could just end the show, but I don't want that. I like doing this show. I like the, like you said, I like talking to musicians. I like talking about music. I like doing all of those things. And I, I love our community too. And I know you do as well. Uh, I, I didn't mean to imply that that, that was any different, but um, as I started playing with different ideas about what the show could be and and thinking about it, it was like, oh, no, I like there's a really fun world here for all of us. And especially your feedback, folks, about how much you've appreciated all the, the guests that we've had on this year and the different perspectives and really just embracing that and saying, like, OK, well, let's let's like that is the opportunity that we have. Let's go with it. Let's embrace all of these different ideas. Let's get this flowing. Let's get some different fuel into this machine that we have here and let's, let's run with it. And, uh, so I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be more work only because I, I don't, <laughs> I, well, because I, like my schedule isn't automatically filled. Like I, I need to figure out who's going to be on and, I, and, and it's all good. Like we've already got January, most of February planned out like, and, and plenty more, in the coffers for that. So we're like, we're fine. However, thus far it has been the ideas of me, Paul and, uh, and my friend Russ miles, who has been a great uh, resource during this, uh, you know, kind of talking through this transition and, and all of that. 
But I, there's no reason to limit it to three brains. We've got thousands of brains together here. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com. If there's anybody or any brand or anything that you think would be uh, beneficial to run through the machine that we call GigGab, say the word. We'll, we'll reach out to anybody. And, you know, we're pretty good at making things happen. So, um, you know, I've got what, one thing that we've leveraged a little bit uh, but not a ton over the last nine years because we just enjoy talking to each other is, you know, we, we have some inroads to some people who whose names, you know, and we haven't we pulled from a, a few of them, but not all of them. So maybe maybe that's what 2024 will bring. So some fun stuff, I think. But also it'll be great. Yeah. It just I mean, hearing from the people who are like us as well, the a.k.a. the people whose names you don't know. And uh, I, I've I've found as much, if not more value out of the less famous amongst us. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot to do. I I'm, I'm excited about it. So I'm, I'm excited about it because I've, I've already had months to embrace the idea of gig gab without Paul. I understand and am sensitive to the fact that all of you are hearing about this for the first time now. So we've got several more weeks where it's gig gab as usual. We'll process this together and then we'll take it into the new year. And Paul's always around. I be, be, I'll be almost around, but I'm I'm pretty sure the first show that you when you knock it out of the park and have some you know fun with someone else, I think the path will be clear to keep on going. So <laughs> it's all blue sky, Dave. Oh I, yeah, no, I'm I see the blue sky. I just I know I know what it's like. We're humans, right? We have change resistance. Change is hard, and it's just part of our our core. Uh, you know, it's part of our DNA, so to speak. So I, I get it. That, that there's going to be some resistance to this. And I'm uh, that's okay. We'll we'll work through that together, folks. It's We'll, we'll make it there. And then we'll have Paul back on, on the regular. Um, we'll, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be fine. When it's I get something good to say, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ring you up and, and we'll get something scheduled. And we'll, we'll make it happen. Absolutely. We, we yeah. do know how to, yeah, there's, yeah. Hopefully, I can't imagine it's not, but hopefully it's clear that there's no, like, I've only said the F-bomb once on this show. And there's no F you between me and Paul here. This is not what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be a very different show if that was lingering out there, wouldn't it? I think I think they would already know that. Like, I think that would be painfully obvious. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mentioned that I, I went and rehearsed down with uh, with Dallas Corbin for those, those uh, country Christmas gigs that aren't happening because Christmas is canceled. And I was reminded, I played for, I don't know, what, three hours or something. It was at this place where where Dallas slash Dave works, and he's actually going to come on. He's got some great stories that they are a production house with. I mean, this was just a huge warehouse of, like, instruments and lights and a huge stage and all kinds of stuff. So, like, they do production for all kinds of shows, and obviously Dave plays his own show, so we'll have Dave on the show, too. But um, yeah, I went down there and I had no idea what to expect in terms of like gear. He's like, just bring, he's uh, really what he said was bring your in-ears. That was it. He was like, oh, do you mind practicing on in-ears? And it's like, well, obviously you haven't been listening to the show recently. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> it's like, I was stressed out about this rehearsal having to like play through a wedge or listen through a wedge. And uh, so I'm like, no, that sounds great. And of course, you all know me. I don't travel without being prepared. I'm ever the boy scout. And so I had snare drum and stool and pedal and cymbals in my car, but I brought sticks and, and, um, and my ears in as instructed. And I sat down, it was this fine, like DW kind of stock kit with some Zildjian cymbals or whatever. And, uh, and well, I, I, the, the first thing I thought was this is, I, I love playing. I love the opportunity of playing on a different kit because you get, I find inspiration from the drums and cymbals being in different spots. Like I can't pl close my eyes and play right out of the gate like I can on my kit because my hands don't know where everything is. But because of that, you know, there's a little more lag time or a little less lag time getting to that crash cymbal, a little more lag time getting to the ride or the floor tom or whatever it is. And I just love that idea. And I think the only people who would be nodding their heads along with me on this are drummers. Because, mm. uh, because as a guitar player, you like the idea of having an instrument where the action is different is probably the your least favorite thing. I, I would think. 
Like, but that's just the action. I mean, there's other things. There's, you know, all guitars sound different. Mm. So just your specific comment about the time to get from one place to another might be different and therefore sure, you sure. find creativity. But, you know, anything about a guitar that's different can make it interesting. So if a guitar that's has fair. super high action, maybe you learn how to be a slide player or, you know, like, <laughs> so, so anything that's different is part of the fun about learning to master your instrument. You know, any subtle thing, you know, a different sound, yeah. which inspires a different, you know, song or a different songwriting or a different lyric, you know, just because you're hearing a buzz on that fret on this guitar, or, you know, it's particularly sweet in a certain way, or it resonates a certain way. So it, I think it's not just about placement of things. No, and that's fair. Difficulty or, or ease. I think it's just about difference. Yeah. No, you're right. Because like there, the snare drum that he had, it was just this stock DW snare. And like the way I could get a, a nice little buzz roll out of it, the way it sounded with brushes, which is a, a lot about the head, obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, it is about the head um, as much as anything else because, you know, you're literally scraping metal brushes against the head. Um, really, it just, just, you know, I love that sound and it, it inspired me to play differently. I, I, I can't help but mention that, you know, at the end of the rehearsal, I thought, you know, I didn't move anything around on like that frigging guy who subbed for me back a couple of weeks ago, but you know, <laughs> whatever. Still he, bitter. Still I, you bitter. know, it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. You could just, it, there's, there's different kinds of people in the world and uh, it's fine. It's, but it was, I loved it. I really appreciated like just, I, I, I had, it had been a little while since I played on somebody else's kit and it was like, right. I just, you know, I'm finding different things to do. And of course, some, there was this one Lucas Hoge tune uh, that starts out with this crazy drum fill. Thankfully, I didn't dig into who played it. The keyboard player thinks it was Vinny Kaliuta, which is great um, that I did not know that before I sat down to learn this fill. It's super bizarre. But um, I, I had trouble playing that the way I wanted to play it because the toms weren't in the places. But it was like, all right, well, I know what what rhythms to play. I'll just play them on different colors of instruments and it's fine, you know, and it was, it, it, wor it worked out great. You know, it set up the tune the way it needed to. So I don't know. It's fun. I, I, um, I like that idea of, uh, yeah. And it totally makes sense that with a guitar, even the amp might make a difference or whatever, you know, whatever you've got in a pedal board. Yeah. 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 Oh, that makes perfect. Sense. Sound is, is inspiring. It's, it's inspiring. Yeah. It, it like excited me about, I mean, I have a new kit that I've been playing and that's been inspirational, but also frustrating because it's like, oh, I, I want to get this exactly right. But it takes a little while to, you know, from even from gig to gig, like just getting it in there. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that's what I got for today. You got anything else, man? No, nope, that's all I got today. But thanks for all the kind words, Dave. We've really had a great run. I'm going to enjoy the next two shows. Let's ride it out in style and then, you know, set on the new course and it'll yeah. be fun to come and visit and see what you've done with the old place. I, I will I endeavor to keep it sparkling clean and maybe even grow it to be a little bit bigger uh, so that you got more room to stretch out next time you come back. But we got two more episodes together, I think, at least two. Certainly. <laughs> What's that thing we say, Paul? Always be performing. <laughs>